Uh, good morning. I welcome you to worship on this somewhat belated uh, communion Sunday. And let's get right into the announcements. Uh, Sunday, March 8th, uh, that's today, second Sunday in Lent. After worship, there will be a church board meeting in the seekers class. And uh, every Monday in March, a reminder that the Be Well, Live Well series is occurring at the library here, and that's going to happen at 2 p.m. on Mondays. Every Wednesdays, we're having Bible fellowship, looking at the miracles and the wonders of John. There's seven of them, one for each week of Lent. And that, uh, that Be Well, Live Well is a program on healthy aging to study in the ways in which our nutritional needs and so forth change as, as we grow older. It's be going to be conducted by Wendy Hazard, and if you want more information, you can contact her at that number, 826-5243. Uh, no crafters ink. Um, Debbie is betwixt and between and got way too much going on. Tuesday, March 17th. Well, St. Patrick's Day will come a little bit after the fact. We'll, we'll be sick of St. Patrick by the time it comes around, but <laughs> it will be Tuesday, March 17th. Then Friday, March 20th, Ah, the official beginning of spring. I didn't realize the vernal equinox was so early this year. So it is. And then UMCOR Sunday, when we take a special offering to cover the administrative costs for UMCOR, that's going to take place on March the 22nd. Then on March 29th, that's going to be a fifth Sunday fellowship. March does have five Sundays in it. And Sunday, April the 5th, that's Palm Sunday, so that makes April the 12th, Easter. And in between, there's uh, going to be Tuesday, April 7th, the UMW meeting, and Thursday is a Monday Thursday. That's going to be fun to work out. The Ride for World Health Riders will be here. So we'll have the Monday Thursday meal. It'll be an actual meal. We'll have it with them. And then come over here for communion afterwards. Um, then Sunday, April the 12th, that will be Easter. And a reminder, taking Operation Christmas Child donations throughout the year, during March, we're collecting quality crafts. There still are quality crafts out there. Not everything is a one-piece uh, plastic mold. <laughs> that still exists. And a reminder that the audio of the message it can be found on SoundCloud and a video of the worship service on YouTube. In both instances, you can just use the search term Shamrock UMC. So again, I do welcome you all to worship. I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we hear the prelude together. this morning is the God of Abraham praise. It's on page 116 in your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all four verses. <laughs>
in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Thanks, Eve. As we go into our time of prayer, I ask if any of you have any concerns or any joys that you'd like to share that we might take them together before the Lord in prayer. <coughs> yes, Myrtle. Robert Adams passed away this morning early. And they're still in the hospital. <laughs> Rodney Reeve. Reeves. Reeves. Rodney Reeves. He was killed in a freak accident yesterday down the road. Other concerns? joys or concerns. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, God of all mercy and comfort, we come before you this morning to give you thanks for the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ and for the grace that we receive at the table of our Lord through which we are restored, supported, strengthened, and established in you. We pray this morning that your spirit would go out to support, strengthen, and establish those uh, who are in mourning, particularly the family of Robert Adams, Sandra, and, uh, and all the members of that family. We pray also for those who are mourning the loss, the sudden and surprising loss of Rodney Reeves. We ask that you would uh, cushion them against this shock and guide them gently through the hours and the, the days ahead. We ask that you would uh, continue to be with Pete and her sisters on the loss of Lynn, that you would continue to um, watch over Jesse, that you would guide him closer and closer into your presence, that he might come to fully know uh, the light of your presence that he might be ushered by the Spirit into the presence of the King and truly be lifted up. We ask that you would show us also, Lord, your presence, what you have done already and are continuing to do in our world, in our community, in our midst. Grant us the grace to order our lives so that others might know we have seen your light shining in the darkness and are trying to follow the truth that has been revealed to us. Grant that we might serve as messengers of your grace for loved ones and friends whose lives have been darkened by illness or who even now are walking through valleys full of lengthening shadows. You have called us into the light for healing and for wholeness. You call each of us to be lamps in our homes, at work and among our friends. And you call us to shine in our fellowship together, like a city set on a hill, so that your church, this church, may become a beacon of rest, of refreshment, and of hope to those whose lives are yet fraught with darkness. According to your word and your promises, Bring us into the life of light and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is never far from us, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is Because He Lives. It's page 364 in your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all three verses. verses 1 through 4 and 17, 1 through 5. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 
I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. And then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations, and no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. Our gospel reading is John 3, 1 through 21. The whole thing. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? How can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it, come from, where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed, believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come into the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So that's the full context of that verse that is quoted everywhere from uh, football games to train stations to little pieces of rock you have sitting around your house for God so loved the world so that everyone who believes in him may not have perished but have eternal life. And what does that mean? What does that mean to have eternal life? Is it just you believe and you've got it and that's it? You move on? Nicodemus just doesn't get it. And Jesus is trying to tell him, and this is incidentally the passage where we get the idea of being born again. There's a word in there that, in Greek, it could mean either born again or born from above. Jesus is talking about heavenly and earthly things. And I've heard people quibble and say, see, he's really talking about being born from above. None of this born again. Well, he's definitely talking about another birth than the one that we get when we, sounds to me like born again, born above. In other words, you're not just reborn into the flesh. It's a different kind of birth. It's a, it's a birth into a spiritual reality. And the ironic thing is, is Jesus says you can't see the kingdom. And Nicodemus is plainly saying he thought he did see it. He's seeing the wonders that Jesus is doing. And he's saying, nope, you can't see it. You can't enter it unless, unless you're born from above. You have to be in the spirit to understand the things of the spirit. And it's ironic. And he, he ends it by saying this stuff about the light. Everyone who's in the light 
comes into the light and people hated the light because their deeds are... Nicodemus came to him at night. How was he supposed to make of that? Are they doing something wrong by coming to Jesus? Certainly not. Is that an evil deed for him to come and talk to Jesus and yet he's doing it under cover of darkness? Maybe he's not talking about necessarily the light of day. But there is an analogy there because Nicodemus is doing this at night because he doesn't want his position to be threatened. Jesus is already unpopular. He's with the Sanhedrin. If he gets caught hanging out with Jesus and being civil to him rather than just sort of canceling him and holding him at arm's length and not giving him a hearing at all, why all the important groups he belongs to, they could kick him out. He could lose his position, his salary, whatever income he gets from that position. His family might suffer. So he has to come to Jesus under cover of darkness. How tragic and how ironic. But Nicodemus does have something going on on the inside. He loves justice. He's going to be one of the only voices we know of that speaks up as the other leaders are attempting to find a way to betray and arrest and destroy and kill Jesus. He tries to get him to hang on for a second. He says, wait, wait, wait. Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they're doing, does it? Let's find out what actually is going on. Let's take a look first. And he is immediately cut down by a rather scathing comment. Oh, are you Galilean too? Check the, prof, you know, check the scriptures. No prophet will come from Galilee. They've read the Bible and they think, huh, Jesus can't be the Messiah? Can't even be a prophet. Prophets don't come from Galilee. Well, he was born in Bethlehem. They don't know that. But he's basically, what's happening is he's being accused of just siding with Jesus because maybe he's from his hometown. He's just choosing sides based on tribal affiliation. Oh boy, we're, we're getting good at that too, aren't we? Classify ourselves according to this group, that group. And that's what they're accusing him of. And we don't hear that he actually pushes his point. He probably falls silent. He's embarrassed and ashamed of Jesus. He, it's revealed to him in that moment that that faith that he had, that supposedly was gonna express itself outwardly in his religion, well, was nothing. It made me think of an article that I saw this week. It was put up on Facebook um, by Kylie Wilkes, and she had a wonderful succulent plant. You've seen this? This is wonderful. And she was so delighted with it, she was proud of it. She's, she'd had this beautiful thing for about two years now. And she writes, she was so proud of it. It was full, beautiful coloring, just an overall perfect plant. She had it in her kitchen window. She had a watering plan for it. And if someone else tried to water her succulent, she'd get so defensive because she just wanted to take good care of it. She absolutely loved it. And today, she decided that it was time to transplant. It's like, let's give it room to grow. Let's, let's, uh, let's kind of take this thing out. And, and so she found the cutest face that suited it perfectly, and then she says, I go to pull it from the original plastic container it was purchased in to learn that this plant was fake. I put so much love into it. I washed its leaves. I, I tried my hardest to keep it looking its best and it's completely plastic. How did I not know this? She asked herself. I pull it from the container. It's sitting on styrofoam with the sand glued to the top. I feel like these last two years have been a lie. I, I kind of feel like that's how, how Nicodemus must have felt when he shriveled up in there. The moment had come for his heroic stand and he just sort of shriveled up and he thought, I thought this was a living faith. It's like plastic. It's pretty in the window, but it doesn't do anything. And then if you try to get it to grow, of course, it won't. His, his faith was plastic. It, it lacked life. But I, I suppose another way of looking at it would be to say that he did have faith. And because he had faith, he had religion. The problem was, it didn't have him. It's the opposite of the rich young man, where Jesus is talking to him and he keeps saying, what must I do, Lord, to inherit eternal life? And he keep the commandments, do all this. Oh, I've done that for my youth, what else? Jesus looks on him and loves him and says, one thing you lack 
Go sell everything, give it to the poor, then come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And he goes away sad because he had many possessions. And a good way of summarizing that reality is that, see, he didn't have many possessions, they had him. So when his Lord came calling, though he, I think, recognized his voice, he could not follow because he was bound. His possessions had him. That made them an idol. And that's the way our faith should be. That's the way God should be. It's not we don't have faith. The world doesn't mind if you have faith, if you believe something, if you have religion. It's when it becomes clear that your religion has you and you begin to say, my God has me, that I will do God's will. This is scary. You mean you won't follow the rules of the group? We can't count on you to respond to our pressure? You won't hold up your end at any moment? Not knowing which way the wind's coming from, you could just decide you're not going to go along with us? Well, that won't do. You can't have a religion that has you. We can't have a God that has you. You have to have your God, that's fine, but you have to be able to take it or leave it depending on what we're doing at any given moment. That's the goal, I think, of walking in the light. God has us, and so we walk in that light to make sure that what we're doing is within the will of God. And that's where Nicodemus isn't quite yet. But what is God up to? I ask that question, what is eternal life? It's surely it's not just believe and, you know, what happens? What's God up to? What's the goal? And Jesus gives Nicodemus a hint. He says, just as the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's a strange story from the book of Numbers, chapter 29, where the people, I don't remember what they were grumbling, they're almost always grumbling, but the fiery serpents, as it says, were sent among them and they would bite them and they were dying and Moses said, what can I do, what can I do? And God told him to build a bronze serpent and put it on a staff, or maybe a cross. But Numbers 21, 9 says, So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Somehow looking at God's presentation of the thing that was getting them would heal them. Now that word serpent, the NRSV translates it for some reason poisonous serpent. It's fiery, seraphim, like the seraphs around the throne of God. It's a mark of, a, of divinity often. Fiery beings, they're seraphs. They're things that are heavenly or spiritual creatures. And these serpents, this word for serpent, nechash, up to this point in scripture is only used a couple of other times. It's used of the serpent in the garden and of the serpent that Moses' staff becomes. There's something about a, a fight and a struggle going on here. Well, clearly we know what Jesus is there to do when he talks about this serpent imagery because John has announced it in the first chapter when he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't want the sins just forgiven. He wants to draw out that poison. He wants to make us free from that. Now, Nicodemus finally saw the difference. He was standing at the corner of darkness and light, but he wasn't in a position to see the difference. But I think as he sat in that council that day and his nerve failed him and he realized that his faith was phony because he couldn't stand up to this group, he realized the group had him. It wasn't God to whom he belonged. It was his social and cultural obligations. But something about that that day caused him to be able to see the difference between light and dark. And at the end of the gospel, we finally see Nicodemus turning the corner. When Joseph of Arimathea asked for Christ's body from Pilate, and Pilate said yes, we're told that Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came. Bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds, 100 pounds of expensive spices. 
He must have blown a real huge amount of money. It was too late to give it to Jesus in life, but at least now he could minister to his body in broad daylight to ask for his body there before Passover. He finally stepped out into the light thinking, I'm sure with the rest of the disciples, it's over. Our hope is gone. But nevertheless, I will stand with him in the light. Of course, three days later, they discovered that it was by no means too late. It's easy to settle for a faith that looks real but doesn't seem to do anything for us. It's easy to let it just lie in us like plastic and not press for more, but I think that's what God wants us to do. And it is, as uh, someone I met in seminary had wrote just this week in his blog post, what is distinctive has been from the beginning about the Methodist Church, though depending on the time and the circumstance, it will sometimes be buried and it will sometimes be emphasized. And that's the notion of sanctification. It's a distinctly Methodist idea. It comes from the scripture, naturally. It comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul writes, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And in chapter five, he says, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And he concludes the chapter by writing, the one who calls you is faithful and will do this. Most Christians are familiar with the idea of justification, that we're forgiven, pardoned of all past sins through our faith in Christ. We put our full trust in him and in what he has done. So that should any accuser, and we know there will always be at least one accuser, complain to a just God of what we have done and demand that we pay for it, Jesus will step between us and what's coming to us. He'll stand up and say, I take responsibility for my creation. Whatever we were supposed to suffer, he suffers for us. And now when God looks on us, he does not see us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. But with that forgiveness, as Wesley described it, comes that new birth. The Spirit begins to impart into us a new life. It begins to fit us for the new life that God is giving us to live. As Ephesians 2.10 says, we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We're recreated, created anew in Christ by the Spirit. And there's good reason to pursue this. Paul indeed says it's essential, as he writes in Romans 2, 6, and 7, God will repay each according to their deeds to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. In Philippians 2, Paul reminds the Philippians to work out their own salvation to each one of us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure, changing the will so that we're able to step in and to live those good works that he's prepared. He gives us a new life and new and a new life to live, new things to do with the new heart that he wants to renew within us. What is sanctification? Wesley was careful to remind us that it's not being perfect in knowledge. We don't know everything. We make mistakes. Um, We're not free from infirmities. Our weaknesses can lead us to not maybe do all that we think we can. And it's not freedom from temptation. What it is, he described as love excluding sin so that we're free of evil thoughts and evil tempers. We no longer find things that are abhorrent to God, desirable. We love the things that God loves and we love others as God would love them. And like justification, Wesley thought we should pursue this by faith. How by faith? Because it's promised in scripture. It's God's will that we be sanctified. By faith because God is able to do what he promises. This was Abraham's faith that God is able and willing to do it now, and that God actually does it, we believe. 
Not that he used to do it and doesn't do it anymore, he only does it for some people, but that he actually does it. What I like about those verses in Genesis and the reason I picked them out is you notice how they jump a whole lot. It goes from chapter 12 to chapter 17. One minute, God's promising him everything, and he's 75 years old, and the next thing we hear, he's 90 years old. Okay, what happened? He's believed, he's gone. Well, he's gone down to Egypt and had the little thing down there with Pharaoh and and, uh, Sarah. He and Lot got so crowded that Lot went off to live in the valley next to Sodom. Then Lot was taken captive, and Abraham got him back, and then... God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and got Lot out. There was a scene with Melchizedek. Then we're told uh, after Abraham comes to God and says, you know what, I'm not even going to have an offspring. My my servant is going to wind up inheriting my household. God says, no, don't worry about it. So Eleazar was sent to find, uh, eventually, well, that's the point where it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to his righteousness. Then there's the scene with the smoking pot and flaming torch where God basically said, I'll take care of the covenant. And then, for some reason, Abraham decided, I'll go into Hagar. Sure, sure, I believe in God, but I'm not gonna wait for God's way or God's timing. Surely, surely this is the way God intends. He talked himself into believing that his way was God's way, and haven't we done that before? To convince ourselves that this is a good thing, we know that God wants it, well, I'll do it my way. It wasn't. And that's when we come to 17. Abraham's plan B isn't going to work out. And God tells Abraham, go back to believing, Abraham. Walk in my light and not in yours. Walk in the light of believing God's promises until you no longer have faith, but your faith has you, and you walk according to it. Turn the corner, Abraham, believe now. That was Wesley's message when he thought about sanctification. He says, if you're thinking that before you're sanctified, you have to first do this or be that or take care of something else, then you're seeking it by works and not by faith. And if you seek it by faith, then of course you can seek it as you are. And if you can seek it as you are and expect it as you are, you can expect it now. And he concludes, it is of importance to observe that there's an inseparable connection between these three points. Expect it by faith, expect it as you are, and expect it now. How long have we waited How long have some of us sat on top of prayers that we just wondered would they ever be answered? Abraham waited 15 years. But the Lord is faithful. He will do what he promised. Abraham believed so hard he tried it in his own way. How long, how long, Lord? That's frequently asked in the Psalms about 20 times. You'll find it in the Psalms. How long, O Lord, how long will you be far from us? How long will you be angry with us? But it's not just the people who ask that question. It's God as well. How long will you depart from me? How long will you refuse to heed my voice? How long will you water plastic flowers that need no light? Turn the corner. Live in my light. Be healed and be holy. We can look for that with faith. We can look for it as we are, wherever we are, and we can look for it now, especially today, as we prepare to approach the table of the Lord's grace. As we do, may the most distant forgotten prayers of your heart resurface. May they come before God again. Hopes that you thought were long gone, bring them before the Lord and bring them with faith. Receive his grace and see what wonderful thing the Lord might do. So let's get ready for communion. Amen. At this time, I want to invite the ushers uh, to prepare to receive God's tithe and our offering.
Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, thank you for giving us life and the light of Christ in which to live it. In all that you provide, may we be worthy recipients, receiving your gifts eagerly, honorably, with joy and with faithfulness each and every day so that we might put them to work in our lives and in the world and not receive them in vain. Accept now our gifts and put them to work. Bless them and bless us with fresh vision. Enable us to walk in your light with hope and with the courage to dream and to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, it is proper that we should confess our sins to God and to one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. 
and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us with joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. You'll find the responses to the Liturgy of the Great Thanksgiving on pages 12 to 13 of the Red Hymnals. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When our love failed and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The Lord has invited, the table is prepared. You are welcome to come and receive.
Our hymn of dedication is Give to the Winds Thy Fears. It's on page 129 in your red hymnal. We'll sing verses 1 through 3, and after the benediction, we'll sing verse 4 as our response. If you'll stand with me, please. is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ, Jesus, cleanses us from all sin. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, and the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <clears throat> Let us 